Greeting citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this that's constantly going on around us, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing the world's end murders. And these were the murders of two 17-year-old girls. It was Helen Scott and Christine Eady, and they were both killed by a man named Angus Sinclair. Now, Angus Sinclair is a Scottish serial killer who was convicted of four murders, the first of which he committed when he was 16 years old, and he's thought to have committed many more. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically, you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of us. And you can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. They're all Bratterstein, but no pressure. All right, now that I'm done begging you to join my cult, we can get into this video. Now this video is one on a case that I had not heard of. A tale as old as time for me. Um, I was researching another case and this one popped up and I was like, oh, what's that about world's end murders? And it did um, stick out to me because here's the thing. I am a fan of the Cornetto trilogies. And if you're not familiar with that is trilogies, trilogy one. Um, if you're not familiar with, well, three, <laughs> if you're not familiar with what the Cornetto trilogy is, it is three movies, Hot Fuzz, Shaun of the Dead, and the most recent, which, well, it's not new now at all, was the world's end. So when I saw the article and it was like world's end murders, I was like, paint me intrigued. And I went and I looked. And as I started to research this case, boy, oh boy, <laughs> boy, oh boy, was there some information to be learned. This is a very intricate case. And honestly, it's a case that shocked me. It's a case that contains some of the most horrific murders against women, against children. Um, it, in it contains a decades long cold case. Like the murders happened in the seventies and we only got resolution in the last decade. It involves new technology, new laws being passed. So many things happen in this case. There was so much to look into and I read so many articles. I watched so many documentaries. I looked into all the sources and learned all the things so you don't have to. So now I can sit down and present it to you in a concise way all in one place, but buckle in because it's going to be a wild ride. And at the end of this wild ride, I want you to answer the question of the day. And that is this. Do you believe that Angus Sinclair the man responsible for the world's end murders is also responsible for more than the four murders that he was convicted of. Now that I've said all the things I need to say, come gather around and let me tell you the story of the world's end murders. And now I want to start this video off with a quote as I oftentimes do. This is a quote from the judge who would eventually hear Angus's trial after all these years, decades later, when he finally spoke to Angus and Claire, he said to Angus of his murder victims, Helen and Christine. And I quote, Whatever dreams they had, they turned into nightmares shortly after they left the World's End pub, the name of which has become synonymous with these notorious murders. Little were they to know that they had the misfortune to be in the company of two men for whom the words evil and monster seem inadequate. Okay, to get started, let's jump into our handy dandy time machine and head to October of 1977 in Scotland. It was at about 2 p.m. 2 p.m on October 16th, 1977, when a couple was just walking along in Gosford Bay. And I looked at this place and it is the most beautiful place to find literally the most horrible thing I cannot even imagine. As they were walking along the beach, they discovered the body of a young woman. She was dead, obviously. She was naked and she was tied up with her own clothes. And that's a horrible scene to walk into. I can't even imagine it. When I think of that happening to people, I'm always like, I don't know what I would even do. Like, it seems incredibly traumatizing. And it seems like that was going to be the worst call that police get that day, right? But it was going to get worse. Um, six miles away and four hours later, another body was found. There was a farm worker who was looking in a corn stubble field, which I believe is like immature corn. Please, Scotland friends, help me out. I've never heard this term before. But this farm worker discovered the body of another woman. She was naked from the waist down and on her top, she was still wearing her top. And she also had a jacket thrown across her body. And it turns out later they find out that this jacket was a jacket that she had just bought like right before she was killed. It was like a brand new coat. She was really excited to be wearing it that night. Um, she was just left out in the open and she was tied up. Both girls were just completely left out in the open with no attempt to hide their bodies. They were both 
stripped and bound with their own clothing, and these two girls were Helen Scott and Christine Eady. Helen and Christine were longtime friends. They had both just recently turned 17, so they were a bit new to socializing in the nightlife, and they were described as both just, quote, beginning to spread their wings. Both girls were said to have come from very loving families and were both described as sort of innocent and maybe naive girls. Christine was the outgoing friend, the fiery friend, bubbly and feisty. She was definitely like a go-getter. She, at 17, had already gone out into the world on her own. She had already left her uh, her parents' home, her family's home, and she had her own place that she, like, shared, like, she shared an apartment with a friend of hers and already had a job. She was already supporting herself and was seen as a definite leader. Her friend Helen was more of the quiet type, a little shy and sweet, described as, quote, soft and lovely. She wanted to be a children's nurse, and she had left school at 15 and got a job at a kilt maker's company, and though she was not really one to go out on Saturday nights and was never the type to stay out late, on this day, the day that she was murdered, she had left straight from work and went to meet up with some friends to do a pub crawl. So on this night, Helen met up with a friend named Jacqueline. I think she went by Jackie, and they got a drink at one bar, and then Christine and her roommate went to another bar, and they got a drink, and then the foursome all met up together at the Royal Mile, which, for those of us who aren't local, the Royal Mile, I had to look it up, is a group of streets that form the main thoroughfare of the old town of the city of Edinburgh. And there are like several bars in that area. So the girls went from bar to bar and eventually they ended up at the World's End Pub. That was their last stop. And on the wall inside, there's a sign that said, quote, behind these walls is the World's End, end quote. And a lot of people find that to be very ominous considering what happened to these girls. So it was October 15th, 1977, when the girls entered the packed bar. And I do mean packed. I read online that like 200 people came and went from this bar that night, but they were able to get in. Um, a lot of people saw them, obviously 200 people in and out. And they found a seat like towards the back. They sat down, they chilled out. They were technically underage, so they shouldn't have been there drinking in the first place, but they did what they could um, to hang out and have fun. Maybe they were going to get Carvery dinners so that they could drink because according to the in-betweeners, that is a thing. Now, at some point during that evening, um, Helen and Christine's friends, Jacqueline, and the other girl's name was Tony, they came up to the girls and they're like, hey, let's get out of here. There's a super fun party. We should go and do that now and be done with this. That sounds great. But by this time, Helen and Christine did not want to leave because they, at this point, were in the company with a couple of older dudes. And they were like, I, we would rather be hanging out with these guys actually. So we're not going to go. So Jacqueline and Tony were like, okay, cool. That's fine. And they bounced. Okay. And then that left Helen and Christine alone with these men. Now these two girls, Helen and Christine were last seen alive at about 11, 15 PM leaving the world's end pub. And that's why this has been referenced. This has been called the world's end murders because you know, they were last seen at the world's end pub. So they leave and they're in the company of two men. And the last person to actually see them alive besides their, their murderers was actually a cop because this cop was like stationed on the Royal mile in case any of the rowdiness from like the, all the pubs nearby spilled out into the street at closing time. And he was standing out front. And one of the girls, I can't, I couldn't figure out if it was Helen or Christine fell because there was different reportings on it, but the cop like helped her up and he noticed them specifically because Helen was wearing a very distinctive coat. It was like a nice new Burberry coat, very fancy. She had just bought it with her first paycheck and it was the same coat that would later be found thrown over her dead body. So anyways, the cop, his name was John, John, the cop helped the girls up, sent them on their way. And they walked off into the foggy night with the two strangers that they had met that night. The following morning, Helen's parents realized that she had never came home and the alarm bell started going off in their head. They knew that something had to have been wrong because this just wasn't like her. Um, her mom at this point started calling friends to see if maybe she spent the night at one of their houses, but she knew this was a long shot because again, that just wasn't something that she generally did. And so she called and she spoke, I believe, to Jackie and Tony, if I remember correctly. And both girls were like, no, you know, like she didn't stay with us. We haven't seen her. And it was at that point that Tony, who was Christine's roommate, was like, oh shit, like Christine didn't come home either. It was at this point that her parents, Moraine and Margaret were their names, called and reported their daughter missing. So they put in the report and then they had to just kind of sit and wait, sit and wait for any news to come in, sit for them to either have their worst fears realized or for their daughter to just show up back at home with some sort of excuse. And they were kind of holding out hope, but that was quickly kind of 
squashed for them when they were listening to the radio and they heard a report of two young girls' bodies being found out in the open. And then they were really, really like, well, this is, this is our reality right now when the cops called them and said they needed them to come down to identify one of the coats, the coat that one of the girls had been wearing when they were found. Now, both girls had been found more than 20 miles away from the World's End pub where they were last seen, and they were found in horrific condition. I'm going to now describe that, so if that's not something you want, maybe skip ahead like a minute or so, because it is pretty, in it's pretty intense. It was determined that both girls had been tied up, gagged, beaten, raped, sodomized, and then strangled with items of theirs and each other's clothing, and then just left out in the open with no attempt at all at hiding their bodies. The girls were both covered in blunt force injuries from kicks, punches, and bites. Like these guys, ugh, animals. These girls had been stomped on and strangled. Like it was a very, very brutal murder. And then certain items had been stolen from them, like certain articles of clothing, jewelry, and shoes. Though it didn't seem like it was a robbery. It just seemed like they took certain things as maybe souvenirs. Christine's injuries were consistent with being repeatedly punched. Like she was subjected to so much blunt force trauma. And then they had evidence that somebody literally kneeled on her, like kneeled on her body when they were strangling her with their bare hands. They then placed a ligature around her neck and a gag in her mouth that was made out of her own underwear and held in place with her own bra. Her cause of death was due to asphyxia due to the strangulation by the ligature and by gagging of the mouth. Helen's injuries were also really bad. She was covered in scratches and there was a ligature mark around her neck. And she had one injury that was consistent with a shoe, quote, stomping on the left side of her head. They literally left a footmark on her face, dude. Like, oh my God. Like with Christine, Helen's cause of death was asphyxia and that was due to strangulation. She had been strangled with Christine's belt. After the girls were murdered, Helen's little brother said that he just sat in his house and stared at his front door just accepting the fact that he would never see her walk through the door again. And he said that after she died, his family didn't celebrate holidays for like a really long time. It really broke their family, which I can only imagine. And police were like, shit, like they were under a lot of pressure to solve this case immediately because this was like a very intense and particularly brutal double murder. You know what I mean? And it was said to quote, stop Edinburgh in its tracks. The chief constable at the time, his name was Tim Woods. Mr. Tim is what we're going to call him. He said of these murders and the impact they had on the community. And I quote, because of the nature of the victims, complete innocence, and because of the nature of their death, and because there were two of them, it was shocking. It was a shocking, shocking crime. This sort of thing didn't happen here. Now, police responded to these murders swiftly by launching a nationwide manhunt that turned into one of Britain's longest and most famous murder investigations. Roadblocks were set up. Anyone who was in the area that night was questioned. They ended up taking statements from over 13,000 people and ended up putting together a list of 500 potential suspects. But despite their tireless work and their best efforts, they were unable to narrow it down to one suspect. Every man who was at the world's end between 10 p.m. that night and midnight was tracked down and questioned. There were mouse swabs taken from all of the, <laughs> all of the convicted um, criminals. And I don't think it was just people who were in jail. I think it was just people who had criminal records that were born between 1937 and 1960, whose records included a violent or sexual crime. They were mouse swabbed. They were like, we need your DNA because you be violent. And these were violent murders. And then the girls, their case went from just like a local case to like, it blew up and became a nationwide case. It was very, very, very famous in the Scottish media. And the, the photo of the girls, it was a photo booth picture that police used to try to like garner tips and to like promote the case, get leads, ETC, ETC. This photo was like burned into people's brains because it was shown so much. Now, the only real lead that police had is that they believed that two men were responsible for the girls' murders for a variety of reasons. One, several people reported seeing the girls leave with two men, that they were with two men, not one man, on the night that they were murdered. And on top of that, the knots that had been used to bind the girls and gag the girls, it seemed like two different types of knots were used. And I guess two of the knots on Christine's body seemed to be more advanced knots and seemed like they were done by somebody who knew what they were doing, knew how to tie like fancy special knots, maybe who's a boy scout or some shit. 
and um, they were like looked into and an expert did believe that two different people had tied the knots, but they couldn't of course be 100% sure. So after about seven months of investigating this case, the case went cold, it started to cool off a bit because they had looked into every lead that they had. They had followed every trail, every breadcrumb and it led to nothing and no new tips were coming in that led them in any new direction. And at that point they had to like, they couldn't justify using all their resources on a case that wasn't moving. You know what I mean? Like new people are murdered every day. So they had to start taking officers off of the world's end case and putting them on other murders. Now, when this happened, DNA science wasn't really a thing. I mean, it was the seventies. Like what are they going to do with that? Right. But the officers in this case had the wherewithal. No, not wherewithal. I always forget. People always use that wrong. Did you know that? Not wherewithal. They had the presence of mind to take DNA and fibers um, from the girls from Helen's coat and to save them in case DNA ever caught up with them. Now, it did catch up with them eventually, but it took almost 30 years. The murders happened in the 70s. The DNA was taken. The case went cold and it stayed cold till like 2004. So almost 30 years. Now that's already sad, right? Like I can't, cold cases are so sad to me. I can't imagine going that long without knowing what happened to somebody you love and what happens and what, well, what sometimes happens. And what's really sad is that if too much time goes by, not everybody who deserves to have these answers gets these answers. And that's what happened to Helen's mom. Her mom, Margaret, uh, died 12 years after Helen was murdered. She died in 1989 without ever knowing what happened to her daughter and her husband, Helen's dad told her on her deathbed that he would find out what happened for the both of them, which is just, can't even imagine how sad that was. Um, and it took 30 years and it's not to say that nothing happened, um, in that 30 years, because definitely things did happen. They just weren't able to narrow it down until then. Right. Like in 19, I believe it was 1997. Um, there was new advances in DNA and they were able to take DNA swabs that had been taken, um, from the girl's bodies, like vaginal canals and stuff. And they were able to, um, put it into the database not in the database. They were able to take the DNA and they were able to make a DNA profile. They were able to compare them to each other and realize that both profiles came from the same man. And then they were able to take that profile and compare it against the 500 suspects that they had initially. Cause remember I said they had 500, they did that, but there was not a match for any of those 500 men. So they were back to square one. Kinda. Now in 2003, the show crime watch did an episode on the girls cases. Now crime watch is like a British true crime show where they do reenactments of unsolved cases to try to get like more attention on them. So they do this and it's broadcast. And after this episode came out, police got so many calls. They got like a hundred calls from new witnesses who had been there that night and had not come forward earlier in the investigation. Now, one of these calls was from a man and this was a man who said on the night that the girls were killed, he was walking in the Gosford Bay area. Now you remember this is where Christine's body was later found. And he said that he witnessed a van driving erratically. I want you to remember that van for later. As sometimes happens, um, when this episode of Crime Watch aired, it kind of breathed, 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 yeah, new life into the case. You know, they got new tips, things started moving, and the police um, reached out to FSS, FSS, which is the Forensic Science Services, which is essentially like a governmental agency that provides forensic sciences to police departments that need it. They were hoping that FSS could help them find a match for the DNA that they took off the girl's body. So they took the profile, they put it into the database, they ran the numbers, boop, 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 and they didn't get a match. They didn't get a perfect match, like something conclusive, but they did find that the DNA was a partial match to 200 different people. Now, eventually they were able to narrow down this list to one person in 2004. And the way that they did it is wild. And we're going to get into that a little bit later, but this was a man who was no stranger to the Royal Mile. He lived within walking distance in Edinburgh at the time of the murders. He was also a man with a long history of violence against women. A man who at the time that they linked him to this, to these murders, he was in jail at the time already serving life for another murder. Another thing we're going to get into a little bit later. And this was a man named Angus Robertson Sinclair. Angus Sinclair was born to parents, Mary Sinclair and Angus Sinclair senior. And there's nothing in Angus's childhood that like totally gives us insight into what he would become later. Things were like kind of tough, but they weren't like insanely tough. You know, it wasn't like I'm going to become a serial killer tough. 
Not from what I can tell. He was born June 7th, 1945, and he was the youngest with an older brother and an older sister. And his family was considered to be hardworking, but didn't have like a lot of money. So the area that they lived in wasn't the best. It seemed like there was a good amount of crime happening around him, but that could be said for lots of kids. He was a bit on the small size for his age, and he was, because of that, a bit of a target for bullies. There were probably other reasons as well, but he was a target for bullies. So that is already tough, I will say that, because, like, no kid deserves that. And on top of that, his father did die when he was only four years old, so now he's from a family where he doesn't have both his parents. Therefore, his mom had to work twice as hard and twice as often to get enough money to support herself and her three kids, you know? So due to this, there wasn't really anyone at home to sort of discipline the kids often and keep them in line. But with that said, he had a brother and a sister who did not turn into murdering dickheads. So where is the issue here? Angus was a bit of a weird kid. When all the other kids would like play in the yard, Angus would just sort of hang back and watch. He was an observer, a people watcher, not a participator. Partly by choice and partly because the other kids thought he was kind of a nerd and they didn't want to party with him. Shortly before his 13th birthday, he started at St. George's Road Secondary School. And I'm not totally familiar with what secondary schools are. Like, do kids live there? Like, I tried to look it up. Um, This school has since been demolished, so I couldn't find a lot of information on it. Like, my answers were not clearly answered. My questions were not clearly answered. So let me know what the situation is, because we don't, I don't think we have those here. If we do, I've never seen one, heard of one, been to one. Moving on. Anyways, his time there was not fun. He didn't have a good time. He was there for a long time. Not a good time. Like the boys, like I said, they picked on him. He was bullied a little bit. And though he was interested in girls, they were not interested in him. They thought he was like a weird little dude. He was described as a failure, both socially and academically, which like, ouch. Well, not ouch, because he does grow up to be kind of a dickhead, but we can feel bad for the child without feeling bad for the adult they become, right? That's something that people need to learn how to do um because it sucks that kids have to go through things like that but we can't sympathize well i mean you can do whatever you want i don't sympathize with murderers because that's lame right but anyways one psychiatrist who examined angus when he was younger said that he was quote not a simpleton but below average intellectually that's a loose quote because i know i messed it up um so he just wasn't having a great time as i'm sure you can gather from the things that i said And as soon as he was legally able, in 1960, he dropped out of school and he got a job as a van boy, which I had to Google because I was like, what the f*** is a van boy? And it's basically a boy. It's not funny. It's a boy who rides around in a van and helps like deliver goods with the van driver. Six months later, six months after leaving that school and getting that job as a van boy, that's when he would start his career of sexually assaulting women, girls, female creatures, whatever. It first started when he was 15 years old and he was arrested for lewd practices against an eight year old child. Okay. And he was going to slap on the wrist for this. He was given three years probation, which is not enough. I don't care if you're 15, like that's, if you're willing to do something like that, something needs, something's got to give, something needs to be done. And allegedly this gave him the confidence to go on to do what he did next. This um, lack of repercussions for what he did when he was 15 years old. That same year, the same year that he was arrested for sexually assaulting and decently assaulting an eight year old child, he was arrested and pled guilty to culpable homicide. Now culpable homicide varies like from place to place on what it means, but essentially it seems like it means involuntary. But let me tell you what he involuntarily did. When Angus was 16 years old, he involuntarily quote unquote, air quotes, F that guy, was arrested for the murder of seven-year-old Catherine Rehill, a seven-year-old child, and he served six years for this. He sexually assaulted and then strangled her to death in his family home before throwing her body down the stairs, claiming to police and her family that she was in a terrible accident. And for this, he was convicted of culpable homicide and given only 10 years and served only six. He served less years in prison than she lived on this planet. The judge who heard Angus's case called him, quote, callous, cunning, and wicked. And a psychiatrist basically said that he would remain a very dangerous sexual predator. But sure, 
Let's let him out in six years for killing a seven-year-old child. Now, I know I breezed through Catherine's murder, which is really not my style to do. You know, I like to really get deep and into the weeds on everything that we talk about here. But the thing is, is that Angus had a lot of victims, okay? He had so many victims that, like, four that we know of. Catherine's one of them. The world's End murders. We have one more to talk about today. And a lot of suspected victims, right? So it would be a lot to cover all in one video. It almost feels like maybe all of his other victims and potential victims deserve a video of their own. I don't know. Anyways, after being released from jail for murdering a seven-year-old, Angus went on to seemingly get his life together it, from the outside looking in. It looked like things went well. He went out, he found love, right? He met this nurse trainee, a beautiful, I assume, I didn't actually look up a photo of her um, because she plays such a small part in the story, um, a woman named Sarah Hamilton. They got married. They got a home. They had a son named Gary. Um, and it just seemed like he was doing really well. I got a job as a painter, like everything was going well, right? Like he's a model citizen. Rehabilitation at its finest. Spoiler alert, fucking no. <laughs> it is believed that in 1977, Angus Sinclair went on a murder spree where he killed at least six women in a span of seven months. Of these six women during the spree, Helen, Scott, and Christine Eady were of those six. There are four more just in that year that are linked to him in addition to others. And again, that might be something that we might just have to talk about a little bit later. So Angus went on committing crimes for a while without getting caught. It's very frustrating, but things did catch up with him eventually. And in 1982, he was finally arrested. So this was years after the World's End murders. He ended up being charged with a bunch of rapes and sexual assaults of young children, which is just like disgusting. And for this, he was actually given life in prison, which is like good because he's a monster, right? But he's a monster that was doing surprisingly well in prison. He was like a model prisoner. He had a prison job. He had his prison life. He was doing great. And it was while in prison that the higher ups, people in law enforcement were like, hey, Angus, would you mind giving us some of your DNA <laughs> so that we can enter it to a database that we're building, right? And at this time, DNA was still in such like, in such like, it was in its infancy, right? It wasn't being used in a way that would lead him to believe that this would come back to bite him in the ass later. So he agreed to give it to them. And let me just say, it did come back to bite him in the ass later, hence this video. It first bit him in the ass in 2001. So this was years after he gave his sample. He probably forgot that he even gave it, to be honest, because this was like so long ago. He's like, oh shit, that DNA I gave, what would that be, like 20-ish years ago, a little under 20 years ago, is now coming, these dogs are coming to bark? I don't know if that, that's, that's not a saying. Anyways, he was still in prison at this time for all of the assaults against children. And he was getting close to um, parole probation type situation, right? And that's when he was linked to his first murder besides Catherine. So the first murder that he had been linked to that he had committed years ago. And this was the murder of a 17 year old girl named Mary Gallagher. Mary had been murdered in November of 1978, so just over a year after the murders of Helen and Christine. Mary had been dragged into the bushes, sexually assaulted, beaten, and had her throat cut and a ligature tied around her neck. Police actually did have a different suspect in mind, but when they tested this person's DNA, it wasn't a match. But then they were like, oh wait, this guy might not be a match. Whoever that guy was, I didn't see who the original suspect was because he didn't do it. But they did have a match in the system, and that was a match to Angus Sinclair. So even though this happened years ago, I said this happened in 1978. He didn't end up getting connected until 2001. And that's because like a cold case review, which we're going to get into more thoroughly um, in next week's video, a cold case review looked into her case, was able to pull it out, was able to see that there was DNA, put it into the database, bing, bang, boom, Angus Sinclair. And because of this, police were like, huh, we were able to get this guy after decades of him being free. Maybe we should look into some of our other cold cases. But real quick, before we move on to other other things, many other things, can you imagine what Angus was thinking? He must have just been like, oh, damn, dude, I can't believe I gave that DNA. Because at the time, he couldn't have known that it was going to link back to him. But knowing what he had done, he knew what he had done. He knew what he could potentially be connected to. How, like, I'm bigger and better and smarter than everyone else is that mentality. You know what I mean? Like, he really thought he was the smartest guy in the room. But anyway... Mr. Tim, the constable at the time, Mr. Tim, he said of Angus giving his DNA, and I quote, no way will he have known or even have thought that one day 
that would be his nemesis. That day that all his debts would come back to haunt him. So for a quick mid-video recap, what he's done so far, assault an eight-year-old, then goes on to murder seven-year-old Catherine Rehill, then commits a bunch of different, allegedly is suspected of committing a bunch of different murders during a killing spree, which we'll talk about later. Then the world's end murders, Helen and Christine. A year later, he murders Mary. Then he changes his MO a little bit and starts assaulting and raping children between the ages of six and 14. Gets arrested for that, is in jail serving life. While in jail serving life, about to get on parole, about to be freaking paroled, is re-convicted, found guilty of murdering Mary. I just wanted to bring us back to speed here on what we've been discussing because I know this is a very involved case and I've been talking about a lot of stuff. Now this is a side note, but I feel like it's worth mentioning because it's one of those things that <clears throat> I cannot wrap my head around. When I learned this, I was like, I'm sorry, but fucking what? And it's one of those things that like I know and I'm haunted by and I feel like I want to tell you so you can be haunted by and as blown away as I am. So when Angus was arrested again for all the assaults against children, he was evaluated again. And he was found to be just as much of a risk now as he was when he was released from killing Catherine. So rehabilitated, I think fucking not, right? So he's back in jail. They're like, oh, he's just as much of a risk as ever. Ah, oh, terrible guy. But at some point during his um, prison sentence, he was given permission to leave jail. Now this is gonna blow your mind. I don't know the logistics of this because I don't believe this is something we really do here. I mean, I know that I've heard of people being released for like special, like dire occasions, special occasions, like serious shit, but <clears throat> he was released to go to a boat festival in Port Sol. Okay, the convicted child rapist and child murderer was allowed to leave to go to a boat festival unsupervised for part of the time where he ran a booth selling what? What do you think he sold at this booth? Children's toys. Who made that call? That's the most ridiculous, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. And I did read that there were no reports of any children being hurt at that time, but like, bro, come on. And after this, the prison system was like, oh, we need to, you know, do a rigorous assessment of of prisoners before we let them out. Like, no shit. Maybe we should have been doing that from the beginning. Maybe we shouldn't be letting child rapists and freaking murderers out around kids and definitely don't let them sell children's toys. I'm not a professional here, but that just seems like common sense. I'm sorry. So now that I've told you that ridiculous bit of information and caught you up on where we are in this case, we can get back to 2004. And this is where Angus was linked with the murders of Christine and Helen. And this is where things get very interesting. Like it's already interesting, don't get me wrong, but this is where it gets very interesting. The way he got caught, his trial, all of that is like, wow. So in 2004, three different Scottish police forces joined together to like create a task force. That was like a team of over 60 different retired officers. And their focus was reviewing unsolved murders from the seventies. And this force was headed by Mr. Wood. You remember Mr. Wood, the um, constable guy? And they called this Operation Trinity. Mr. Wood said that he believed Angus Sinclair was guilty of many murders in addition to the murder of the World's End girls, Helen and Christine, and also Mary and Catherine for that matter, and that he couldn't go on without trying to solve them. He said that sometimes people lose sight of the fact that these were two girls that were murdered before ever getting to live life, before coming into their potential. You lose all of that. You lose anything they could have been, anything their kids or grandkids could have been if they had gone on to, you know, have families if they had chosen to do that. And you forget sometimes, I've talked about this, you know, I, I've talked about how it's important to remember these are real people and to humanize them because you forget about the lasting impact it has on families, especially when you never find out what happens. So this task force looks at unsolved cases. They look at some, they look at like over a thousand unsolved cases and they come up with six, six that bore a unique signature. And when a forensic scientist looked at all of these cases, forensically, science, uh, they determined that they believed that all six of these murders were committed by Angus Sinclair. Of these murders were the two murders, the World's End murders, Helen Scott and Christine Eady. But there were also an additional four women that they believe Angus killed. This was Frances Baker, Hilda McCulley, Cooney, and Anna Kenny. Now, 
The problem was there was no DNA evidence, at least nothing that conclusively linked them because the forensic evidence in these cases, after all these years, bro, had been lost or destroyed. I know, dude, it's so fucked. It's so, it's so frustrating to, to think of evidence being lost or destroyed in a cold case. It's like your negligence has made it so these cases aren't solved. You know what I mean? Especially if they did have DNA and it could now be linked, like, unforgivable. But anyways, they were convinced that he was connected, even though they didn't have any DNA because of the the specifics of their crimes. Um, my brain turned off. Of course, this baby's stealing my brain cells even from outside the womb. Basically, all the cases had similarities that were important um, based on how they were killed, where they were abducted from, where they were dumped in the specifics of how they were killed, how they were bound, how they were gagged, things like that. They, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't work in that kind of field, as you know, but you know that they're, it's a science. You know, it's a science. I know it's a science. I don't know the science. I don't work there, but it's a science. But anyway, Operation Trinity takes their findings and they're like, okay, let's write a report for the crown. So they do just that. They're like, dear crown, we think Angus Sinclair killed all six of these women. We would like to take him to trial for all six of these women. Here's what we have he all of their crime scenes all of their murders striking similarities okay that are all similar to each other but aren't similar to any other cases or any groups or any other people we believe this is our evidence that it was angus let's put him in jail because he did it we think he did it so let's at least try and um the report specifically said because that was like my loose interpretation of what it said was and i quote they were all young women who had been out for the night they had all disappeared off the streets. They had all been transported a distance. They had all been bound in exactly the same way or very similar ways. They had all been assaulted and murdered in very, very similar ways. Now the Crown did end up deciding that they did not want to prosecute, prosecute, prosecute Angus for the murders of Francis, Hilda, Agnes, and Anna for a couple of reasons. Um, one big one, well, two of them are big ones. Um, one, the lack of forensic evidence. There was nothing that actually linked Angus to these murders um, conclusively. There was a lot of like, this definitely looks like it's him, but they didn't feel comfortable um, prosecuting on that. And two, and this is messed up, man, this is real messed up. One of these four murders was technically solved. A man named Thomas Ross Young had been arrested for the murder of Francis Baker. And though he tried to appeal several times, he died in prison in 2014 at the age of 79. Now, I don't know a lot about him. I mean, I know a little bit about him. He didn't seem great. <laughs> but if he didn't kill her and Angus did, that's pretty fucked up. Okay, so moving on. Angus was arrested and charged with the rapes and murders of Helen Scott and Christine Eady in March of 2005. And when he appeared in court, he did not enter a plea and he was remanded into custody. Now, police had DNA evidence that proved that Angus committed these crimes. Obviously, semen had been found inside both girls, and a mixture of Angus's semen and DNA from Helen was also mixed together on Helen's coat. Like, there was a large sample in Helen's coat, along with a sample from a second man. Stay with me here. Remember, the girls were seen leaving with two men. The knots that were used seemed to be tied by two men. And now with the DNA of another man, it's looking like Angus did not do this alone. Now, remember I told you that we were going to get into how police were able to narrow it down to Angus's DNA in the first place. Well, they ended up doing it in a way that was inspired by another case. This is a case that was happening in London in 2006. And this was the murder of a boy named Adam. And Adam wasn't his real name. It was his sort of John Doe name that was given to him. And Adam was an African boy whose torso was found floating in Thames. Now, I haven't looked into this case exclusively. Stephanie Harlow did do a series on this case that's very well done. So if you want to learn about it, I would suggest go and watch that because it's not the case we're talking about today. Whoops. And no one does it quite like Miss Harlow. So basically what happened is investigators in Adam's case and investigators in the World's End case, they spoke. They got in contact with each other. And the investigators on Adam's case were like, hey, you should use this ancestry DNA technology that we've been messing with, you know? You should use this on the DNA found at the World's End murder scene because that's what we use on Adam's case and that was successful. Okay, okay. So they did just that. They created a genetic fingerprint of Angus Sinclair based on DNA that he had in the system. 
And they were like, okay, so we know who one of the people are, but there's other DNA at the, at the scene. Like we didn't know this throughout the video. Like I hadn't told you, but police knew this the whole time that there were two genetic profiles on the girls. So they were like, here's what we need to do. We need to figure out who Angus was close with at the time. So they looked into all the men, any men that Angus knew at the time. And through process of elimination, they landed on a man named Gordon Hamilton. This was the brother of Angus's but like wife. Remember he married Sarah Hamilton, Gordon Hamilton, his brother-in-law. I guess they had went through and they had tested all of Gordon's other siblings just to make sure it was none of them. And all they had left was Gordon. But the problem is by the time that they figured this out, Gordon was already dead. He had died and he had been cremated. So they didn't have any of his DNA to test to confirm that it was him. Apparently no one in his family had kept any of his stuff. And from what I read, it seems like maybe they weren't close anymore because I saw it reported that Gordon quote, died a pauper's death in a Glasgow homeless shelter, which like, yikes, but. So since they didn't have any of his DNA to test, police had to get creative and they learned through science that Gordon had actually helped an old girlfriend remodel and had put up like foam and wallpaper or something that might have his DNA on it. So they go to her house, they remove this piece that he worked on and bing, bang, boom, they got his DNA and it was a match. Gordon Hamilton was the other person who helped Angus and Claire commit the World's End murders. So it appears the two older men that the girls were seen leaving the World's End pub with that night were Angus and Gordon. And I'm like 99% sure that the cop who had helped them, John the cop, had actually seen photos of the men when they were younger and was like, yep, that was them. Now, I don't know a ton about Gordon. There wasn't a lot of information on the internet about him as a person since like he's already died before who he was became relevant. <laughs> Um, I know that he did martial arts, which is something, and that despite their age difference, Angus was older. He and Gordon became very close. And Gordon had even lived with Angus and his sister, Angus's wife, you know, <laughs> Gordon's sister, for a time. Uh, they were buddies. They hung out all the time. And after Angus bought that van, spoiler alert, Angus had a van, the two would take it and go away together on the weekends. They'd go out drinking and fishing. But clearly they did more than just that, because eventually they must have started to discuss their mutual interests, which included... Um, raping and murdering women. Girls. They were under 18. They're children. Moving on. The trial. This is where it gets very interesting and also fucky. So basically what happened is the prosecution put forth their theory of what happened that night. They believed that Angus Sinclair and Gordon Hamilton had either forced or convinced Helen and Christine to get into their van near the World's End pub after they left. And at that point, they were held against their will. Now, if you recall, a man had called in to police with a tip after that crime watcher, crime watch episode aired. And he said that he saw a van driving erratically near Gosford Bay. Well, it turns out this was Angus's van. It was proven that Angus owned a van just like the one that the witness had seen. Basically, it was a van that he had converted into like a camper or a caravanette, if you're fancy. And he sold it in February of 1978. And after that, it passed through several, several owners before being destroyed in 1998. So it couldn't be tested like the interior for DNA or anything like that. Luckily though, for police, some people who owned the van after Angus had taken photos of themselves with it. And they were able to like track these people down and look in the photos. And in the photos, you could see the interior of the van and it looked to be identical, but police then went as far as tracking down another van that had the same like interior as the interior in the photo that was proven to be the same interior that Angus had had because he had, they hadn't changed it after getting it from him. And they took this new van and they tested those fibers against fibers found on Helen's coat. And supposedly it was an identical match. I will say that this is interesting, but not compelling to me since they didn't have like the real van, but I thought it was worth mentioning because they like went at it, trying to prove that the fibers were from Angus's van, even though they didn't have the van because it had been destroyed in 1998. Now, basically what police think happened is that after um, the two men took the girls, that they then went and took them to the area where Christine was found. They stripped her, tied her up, gagged her with her own underwear, and then raped and murdered her. They then went to the area where Helen was found and forced her to walk barefoot into a field where they just beat the shit out of her before raping and killing her as well. They weren't totally clear on which girl died first, but that's what they believed happened. They just weren't exactly sure on what order it happened, but that's what they believed. So by this point, Angus had pled not guilty and he lodged two special defenses, which were consent and incrimination. Basically what he was saying is that yes, 
He was there. He was with the girls. Him and Gordon were together with the girls. And that he had had consensual sex with both girls. And then he left. So any violence that befell upon them, is that a word, befell? Any violence that befell upon the girls was not at his hands, but at Gordon's, who was now dead, long dead of liver failure, so he couldn't be there to defend himself. Who's going to contradict his story? Dead men tell no tales. He literally said <laughs> that these two ch children, these girls were described as like innocent girls, had chosen to join these two older men for a double sex session. And when he was done, he was like, thanks guys, I'm going to go fishing and then left the girls with Gordon and he supposedly killed them himself. It just is so ridiculous to me. It really is. But his defense attorney had one job just to prove that Angus did not rape and kill these girls, that Gordon had done it and Angus had just simply been with them before. The defense argued that Angus shouldn't even be on trial for these crimes because there was insufficient evidence to connect him in the first place. Everything about the case was circumstantial and he basically said that the prosecution or the crown as it's called over there yonder had failed to prove that Angus had been involved in any act of force or violence against the girls and said that there was no proof at all that the sex between Angus and these girls was non-consensual. The DNA on the girls was said that like the chances of it matching to anyone but Angus was a billion to one. So instead of fighting the DNA, he just fought how it ended up there. The defense was essentially like, listen, there were no eyewitnesses that could put Angus there and you have no way to prove that this wasn't consensual and that he wasn't just off fishing after the fact. And this is going to blow your mind. <laughs> this is going to blow your mind. So the jury never even had to make this difficult decision, never had to make this call, never even got to see any of the evidence because the judge agreed with the defense and said that the evidence against Sang Sangus and Claire, Angus Sinclair was neutral at best, whatever that means, and formally acquitted Angus. Robertson Sinclair. Never even put it before a jury, just acquitted him. And he said, and I quote, as far as the murders themselves were concerned, there is no forensic evidence linking the accused to items used to kill the girls. And bro, I know it's like, what? The fuck? But he's, he's honestly kind of right. So what happened here? is that apparently there was additional DNA. There was DNA of Angus's found on the ligatures used to tie up the girls, like the bindings, the neck stuff, all that jazz. There was DNA of Angus's found on it, but the sample that they had wasn't a good sample and it was conclusive, but it like the odds weren't like a billion to one like they were with the, um, the semen, right? So <sighs> the prosecution chose not to include it. They were like, listen, I don't want to give them anything that could give the defense a way to twist it into reasonable doubt, anything like that. I want to leave anything that's not conclusive out so we have the best chance of winning. But it backfired because if he had submitted this DNA, like if this was admitted as evidence, it would be pretty hard to say that that part was consensual. You know what I mean? It would be pretty hard to be like, yeah, I, they consensually let me tie them up and gag them and then they were killed. You know what I mean? Like it would be harder to explain away than just the semen, even though I think that that was like a laughable try, but apparently the judge disagreed, whatever. Um, and if he had submitted the DNA on the ligatures and things like that, the defense couldn't have said that said, said there was insufficient evidence. So at least there would have been a trial. The jury could have at least heard what happened and made their decision, but he was acquitted. <laughs> he was acquitted. And what's real fucked up. And I actually think this was the defense kind of rub throwing some shade rubbing some salt in the prosecution's wounds the defense said to the judge like listen if there was like dna on a ligature or something then i couldn't even stand here and say this but there's not and it's just so messed up dude because this like destroyed their families right i mean maureen remember helen's dad promised helen's mom margaret that he would like get who did this to their daughter and now he's left like broken because he was acquitted that's it double jeopardy that's it like he got away with it or did he and the police who worked on this case were super upset. Operation Trinity, super upset because they felt that they had put together enough evidence and put together a good enough case um, to prove who had done this. And they had no plans to reopen the case because they knew who had committed the crimes. Like, what are we going to do? Open the case and try to find somebody who doesn't exist? No, Angus Sinclair did this. Mr. Wood, you remember the constable? He said of the prosecution's decision to um, exclude that evidence. And I quote, I still don't understand why that supporting evidence was not led. And I mean, while I can't speak for every police officer in Scotland, I certainly know 
that for those who are on the investigation with me and who are still serving officers and can't speak openly about this, there is still an amazement that it wasn't done. This ruling was very controversial and everyone came out talking about it. Like a former high court judge, which is like pro judge, I guess. I don't really know. I'm not familiar. I'm not from Scotland, but he came out and was like, listen, I think we need to have some legal reform here because I feel like if a judge is put in a position where they have to make such a difficult decision, like in this case, um, maybe they should be able to consult with other judges to get a second opinion before making their decision. They were like, listen, basically this is the wrong fucking decision. And maybe we should make it so multiple people make a decision when it's something this serious. And the same judge was also like, also, maybe we should, again, have some reform in the legal system where prosecutors can appeal a judge's decision and not just a jury's decision. So he was like, this was all wrong and we need to do something about that so it doesn't happen again. Now, something I found to be very interesting and noteworthy in this case was honestly all of the absolute drama between the judges and the lawyers in this case. So basically, when that one judge came out and was like, legal reform, the prosecutor on the case, the one who was trying to get Angus in jail was like, she was a woman, by the way, I think that matters. And she was like, yes, 100%. I agree with that. We should be able to appeal judges, um, judges decisions if we think that they are not chill. And the judge that she was talking about, like the one who made the decision and like other big time judges were like, hold my beer. And they basically came out and they were like, judges decisions need to be respected and basically scolded the prosecutor for speaking openly about being for the reform and was essentially like, you need to, you can have your opinion privately, but you don't need to be speaking publicly about not agreeing with judges. And I was like, okay, first off, I'm paraphrasing because the article I read about that had a lot of large words, but I was like, can we all calm down here? Like, But I thought it was very interesting to read. Just the drama man. And another thing that came out in this case was the conversation around whether or not a person's prior criminal history should be admitted as evidence in new trials. And that is important because it applies to this case. Now, the reason this matters in this case is because to us, to those who know what Angus Sinclair has done, it seems very obvious that he did this, that he committed these murders, right? When you look at what he did to Catherine, what he did to Mary, what he did to all of those kids, it proves he is a murderer and a serial sex offender. Like he, when you look at it, with the totality of evidence, plus his history, it seems very clear that he did this. But the jury wasn't privy to that. Not like it would have mattered because the jury um, didn't hear the evidence, but no one knew, the public, no one had any idea that Angus Sinclair was a convicted murderer and serial rapist until after he had been acquitted. And then everybody found out. And everyone was fucking pissed. People were very upset because they were seeing this as a obviously guilty man getting away scot-free because like could his events his version of events have happened sure but did they no obviously they didn't like that doesn't make any sense and on top of that like he had been acquitted double jeopardy laws there for a reason right because you don't want your government to be able to try to put you in jail for something and not get the result that they want and then try you over and over again until they get the result they want right but also double-edged sword because with double jeopardy as it stood if new evidence was found that that conclusively linked you to a murder that you had been acquitted for like sucks to suck i've already been acquitted i'm a free person you can do nothing people were not satisfied with this so what ended up happening and this is absolutely wild is they changed the double jeopardy law and i'm like fairly certain, like 99% sure that it was because of this case. I could be wrong, but from the way it was worded and the things that I read, it seems like this case pushed them towards actually changing this law. That and like other countries like um, England and Wales had already made modifications to their double jeopardy laws. And basically Scotland was like one of the last ones in line to do this. Um, so they were probably like, well, everybody else is already doing it. And now we have this situation. So maybe we should change our laws as well. And basically what happened was the Scottish Parliament passed the Double Jeopardy Scotland Act of 2011, which long story short, in regards to this case, it meant that if new evidence was presented, a person could be tried for the same, cr same crime twice. Though Scotland set significant tests for the prosecution to overcome before an accused person who has been acquitted can be tried for the second time for dangerous crimes like rape and murders. And I mean, 
it appears this was done retroactively because now they can go back and retry Angus and Claire. And that happened in 2011. Not the retrial, but the, um, the law being changed, 2011. And from there, things happened pretty quickly. Uh, in 2012, it was announced that the World's End murder investigation was being reopened because new evidence that was not pre present, present at the time of the original trial had now been presented. It had now been found. Bing, bang, boom. New evidence. And this is one of the things that was needed to retry a person under the new double jeopardy law. Shit was going down. In 2013, there was a hearing with several judges um, and the prosecutors, and it took like several days of the prosecutors basically presenting a case as to why Angus and Claire should be retried with their new evidence. And after like a couple of months, I think it took like a review process, you know, it takes a little bit of time for these things to happen. I uh, know how the legal system works over here. I don't know about over there, but everything takes forever. It was determined that Angus and Claire could be retried for the world's end murders. And he was going to be the first person to be retried since the double jeopardy law was passed. The second trial began in 2014, which was seven years after the first trial and new evidence was submitted. Um, one of the things that was submitted was soil from the bottom of Helen's feet from when she was presumably walked into that field like they had, you know, thought happened. And on top of that, they had found new DNA. They found more DNA on the girl's body because they used a new technology called crime light, where essentially there's a hair in the air. Essentially, crime light is like these scientists wear these goggles and they shine different colored lights. <laughs> I sound so stupid. I don't understand completely, but different colored lights that bring up different things that you couldn't see with the naked eye. And from doing this, they were able to see that there were DNA in places that they couldn't previously see that it had been there. So it had been there the whole time, but they weren't able to actually detect it until crime light was used. This was the first time that crime light was used in a Scottish criminal case was in the world's end murders. Basically when they used that light over the evidence they had, they found that they could see much more DNA on the items that were already uncovered in the scene, including more DNA that they had initially not seen on the ligatures that were used to bound and strangle the girls, not bound, bind and strangle the girls. They were also able to find that DNA that was found um, inside Helen's coat and on the ligature made of her bra and tights around her neck were a match to Angus. And the odds of this DNA belonging to anybody else was a billion to one. And real quick, I found this quote from this article I read and they were talking about crime light and, spe and specifically, they were talking about crime light specifically. And when I read this quote, I was like, that's a really good quote. And you know how I like a good quote and I like to share a good quote with you. So I wanted to read it to you. <laughs> the DNA samples were found deep in the knots of the ligatures and had remained hidden from view for more than 30 years until scientists could literally shine a light on the evidence. It's a good quote. And all jokes aside, 30 years, 30 years, man. Can you imagine how hard that was on our family? I know I already mentioned that her mother died, but like, I remember reading that her mom said that she would just sit up awake at night, just sit waiting, wondering if it would ever be solved, if she would ever know what happened to her child. She said that it was um, a living sorrow for her whole family. And I was like, damn, that's really sad. And she just waited and waited and waited and died. You know what I mean? She never, she never got to know what happened to her daughter. And I think that that's really sad. Like it's great when these cases can be solved so long after the fact, but it's tough because it's like, yeah, it's solved. And we know now we know who did this, but like should have happened sooner. It's basically, and I know that it couldn't and like the, the science wasn't there, but it's just a shame. It's a shame. Well, I, the science was there. Um, it's just a shame. It's a shame that, not everyone who loved her got to know what happened to her, but at least it is solved. They were so young and they died in such an awful way. They really did deserve justice, right? Like everybody does. It's just like how they died is so scary and so intense to me. I mean, the, the uh, prosecutor even said that their deaths were quote, terrifying, horrific, and barbaric. Angus tried to deny it, of course, and his attorney tried to say that the evidence they found was unreliable since, you know, this was the first time the science had been used, but the jury um, was like, not nah, dog, like we don't believe you at all. And after just two hours of deliberation, they found Angus and Claire guilty of the murders of Helen Scott and Christine Eady in November of 2014. So 37 years after their murders, and he was brought down by evidence, by DNA that he had given voluntarily. The judge said to Angus, and I quote, you have displayed not one ounce of remorse for these terrible deeds. The evidence in this case, as well as your record, details of which have now been revealed, shows that you are a dangerous predator who is capable of sinking to the depths of depravity. He added, quote, 
I do not intend to waste many words on you. You are well aware that the only sentence I can pass is one of life imprisonment. Angus Sinclair was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum sentence of 37 years, which I believe was just for the trauma because, you know, it had been 37 years since the case was solved. And um, this was effectively a death, death sentence for him because at the time that he was convicted, he was 69 years old. Hmm? And he would be 106 before he'd be eligible for parole. So, oh, and fun fact, or just fact, this was like the longest minimum sentence in, in Scottish history at the time. It might still be, but it was at the time. The prosecutor said of Angus's conviction, and I quote, Thankfully, justice has no sell-by date in Scotland. To which I say, this doesn't even sound like a real person. This doesn't sound like a real quote. It sounds like this guy, girl, person, has been watching too many movies. After the guilty verdict was given, um, Helen's family did speak to reporters, and they said that they finally had justice for Helen and Christine. And Helen's dad, Moraine, remember, he was like in his 80s by this time, and he talked to reporters about how he promised his wife that he would get the guy who, who did this to their daughter. And he said that at the time, he had no idea if and how he was going to actually make that happen. He also said that he thinks about Helen every day, that he wondered what she'd be doing with her life, if she would have gotten married, if she would have had kids, if he'd have grandkids. Just, that's sad, just to think about her all the time. And her brother, uh, Helen's brother, said that, I think his name was Kevin, he said that he thought that 37 years was appropriate because it had taken 37 years for him to get put in jail. And he also said, like, the most heartwarming thing. He said that after the verdict was read, he went to Helen's grave. And that when he got there, there was a shit ton of roses left there. And they weren't left by him. He said he didn't count them, but there must have been, like, 30 roses. And he said that with these roses, there was a card that said, quote, As a nation, we will never forget. Moraine, Helen's father, said that he believes that the double jeopardy law being changed is Helen and Christine's legacy. He said that it'll help other families who are in the same position as him, him, excuse me, him, um, get justice that just because they weren't able to previously, if new evidence comes out, they can find out what happened to their loved ones and they don't get to just never have answers, which is, is a pretty sweet thing. Um, it's sad that something terrible always has to happen before something good can happen, but I mean, I guess it's good that something good comes out of good that something good comes out of something i mean you may notice that i talked a lot about helen's family in this and not christine's family and that's because helen's family was vocal and christine's family just wasn't and that's okay that's exactly um perfectly right any way that any person wants to deal with a loss like this is appropriate uh, it's whatever works for them and they've chosen to just stay quiet and not speak to the media and not speak to people about it uh, that just happens sometimes. Everybody deals differently. I remember when my friends were murdered, one of the families, because I have two friends murdered, there were a couple, one of the families speaks out often, spoke to the media often, even did one of those um, TV shows for IDTV, where the other parents don't talk at all and don't want anybody talking to them. They don't, they don't want to think about it, so it's perfectly all right. But I just wanted to explain why I didn't include quotes from Christine's family, because it's not that I don't want to, it's just that they don't exist. Um, but what I was able to find out is that Helen's brother um, did give some information about Christine. Kevin Scott, which is Helen's brother, said that Christine Edie was a popular, friendly, and likable girl who her family dearly loved. And he went on to describe his own sister, Helen, as a country girl with beautiful blue eyes and a beautiful smile that he will never forget. Now, Angus Sinclair did try to appeal his conviction, as everyone always does. He said that the 37 years was successive and that it was done simply for the drama, which he's probably right. And he also said that he believed that his previous crimes were taken into consideration when it came to sentencing him for these particular murders and that that was improper. He listed a couple other things like blah, 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 like other cases and the types of sentences they got in comparison to him. But the appeal was unsuccessful and it didn't end up really mattering anyway. In 2019, Angus Sinclair died in his prison cell at the age of 73. I guess he suffered a series of strokes, which is really just his awful, awful, evil body eating itself from the inside out, you know, and just destroying him. But in reality, I think he just died in his sleep. So that's a kindness that he didn't give the people that he tormented, but okay. I guess there's something I read that was interesting is that I guess there was no sketchiness or anything regarding his death. No, like worrying that he wasn't getting the care he needed. But whenever a prisoner dies in jail, they do a fatal incident inquiry where they look into it and make sure that nothing happened and like family members can be part of that to like confirm that their family member was treated fairly and they like reached out to angus's family and was like would you like to participate in this and they were just like no <laughs> we do not claim him 
Helen's brother Kevin said of Angus's death, and I quote, He was a monster. To treat innocent people the way he did was just evil. You would need to be a beast to commit those crimes. I would have wanted him to live longer, to serve more of the 37-year sentence as opposed to getting the easy way out. I do feel for the families of the other victims that he may have had. They'll never be afforded the kind of justice that we received. Now, he was referring to the other victims that Angus Sinclair is thought to be connected to. We know he killed 7-year-old Catherine Rehill, 17-year-old Mary Gallagher, 17-year-old Helen Scott, and 17-year-old Christine Eady. But he was referring to the four other people that he was linked to through Operation Trinity. 37-year-old Francis Baker, 36-year-old Hilda McCulley, 23-year-old Agnes Cooney, 20-year-old Anna Kenny, and then... There are two more that others think he was responsible for that I haven't even gotten into today. That's 63-year-old Eddie Catagno and 25-year-old Helen Kane. Angus Sinclair was walking in the free world till he was 16 years old before being arrested for the murder of Catherine. Then when he was released, he was walking free for another 14 years before he was finally put in for life. So who's to say how many people he's really responsible for murdering? That sad, strange little man, standing at only 5'3", which I didn't even mention through this video, but he was just a little, little guy, did not look like a dangerous man to just see him walking on the street. But he was clearly capable of just depravity and extreme violence and just disgusting, horrible behavior. Just extreme violence and destruction and the sheer depravity that is needed to do the things that he did. He was convicted of killing four people. And though we'd have no idea how many he really did kill, how many people, how many lives he took, police have their list, the people that I've touched on today that they think that he was responsible for killing. And that's just so many people. That's so many stories that need to be told. And with how long this video already is, I couldn't include them today. But I do believe that their stories deserve to be told. I think the untalked about, the unsung, victims of Angus Sinclair. The unknown victims of Angus Sinclair deserve to be discussed. So that's what next week's video is going to be about. So now that I've told you all the things that there are to know, given you all the information that I have to give for now, I want you to answer the question of the day. And obviously you'll get more information next week, but just for now, surface level, when you've heard about Angus, not knowing all the details of the other crimes. Do you believe that Angus Sinclair is guilty of more murders than the four he was convicted of? let me know in the comments below. But anyways, guys, that completes this video. I hope you found it interesting and informative and it gave you all the information you would want when looking into this case. And of course, thank you for remembering Helen and Christine with me today. God, thank you for remembering all of the victims of Angus Sinclair with me today. The ones we haven't discussed yet, Helen, Christine, Catherine, Mary. This man has such a path of destruction and it's just like, crazy to think that one person can do so many horrible things. I don't, I'll never understand that mindset, man. It just doesn't go there. But anyways, guys, please let me know down below of any cases you'd like to see me cover in the future. As you know, I have a long list of cases, but when you leave a suggestion, I add it to the list with your name next to it to give you a shout out if I cover it. I love looking into the cases that you guys suggest because you often suggest cases that I haven't heard of or cases that need more coverage. And I know you're filled with good ideas and good taste. Otherwise you would not be here. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you, specifically you. Speaking of which, I put a, an announcement video about this up, but I did create a membership if you are curious about it. Um, basically, you get some perks, you get early access to non-sponsored videos, things like that. Um, if you click on this video down, down there, it should say join, and you can go and read the specifics of it if you're interested. Um, also, down below there will be a link to my merch store. This is a new item that I launched in my merch store and I'll also put a list of other uh, true crime channels that you might be interested in checking out if you like mine. And yeah, that's pretty much it. I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday and I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.